My name is Jim, and we're going to be talking about why you should buy one of these, a Bridgeport milling machine, today on Manjaro. This is going to be the first in a series of videos on this Bridgeport milling machine. So today I'm going to talk about what this is, a little bit about what it can do, and why you should want one. Then next I'm going to talk about what all the different knobs and dials and switches and everything that are on here, what they do and how they work. It's not going to be a super in-depth video. I am by no means an expert machinist. There's people that spend their entire career machining on a Bridgeport, and there's a lot of people out on YouTube who make much far better videos about how actually to do machining than I could ever do. But I'll give you a little overview, just kind of what you're looking for and what everything is, so you have some idea what you're looking at. Then the last video is going to be, if you decide you want to go buy a Bridgeport, what you should look for, roughly how much you should be spending on it, and kind of things to watch out for and accessories that you should be looking for. So first off, what is this? So this is a vertical knee mill. So it was popularized by the Bridgeport company. They started building these about 100 years ago now, and they've kind of slowly evolved into what you see here and a little bit beyond that. So this is a 1974 model. They're still making these today. They look very similar to this one here. Um, they've upgraded them over the years. Frequently they put bigger motors on. There's a couple other little features that I'll talk about in the bot how to buy a Bridgeport video. Generally though, this is a, a kind of normal example of a Bridgeport and what it can do. So the main thing that this can do is spin this thing here and with a tool that's in here, you move it across the table, and that makes whatever you want to do. Bridgeport were not the first ones to make a machine like this, but they were the ones who made it most popular. And they kind of standardized the design of what these look like. Now there were lots of other companies making them. There still are lots of other companies that make them. They make Some companies will make one that is basically an exact copy of this, down to the fact that even the parts all fit together. Other companies will change the design slightly, sometimes to improve it, sometimes to make it smaller, sometimes to make it cheaper, depending on what they're going for. I'll call this a Bridgeport usually, even if I see another machine that is made by a different company that looks very similar, I'll still call it a Bridgeport, and people generally know what you're talking about if you say that. About 10 years ago, I was looking for a new drill press. I had a small drill press, but the quill travel on it, that's this part that goes up and down, was only about two inches, and that made it really irritating to use. Depending on if I was trying to drill a hole in a different thickness of material, or using a different length of drill bit, got in the way all the time, and I constantly is adjusting the height of the table. In addition, it didn't have a lot of power, and it wasn't particularly sturdy, and it was just a pain to use. So I was looking for something better. I wanted something that was floor mounted, had a nice big table so I could put big work pieces on it, and would have a little bit more power, and most importantly, had a very long quill travel. So I came across this Bridgeport milling machine. Now this makes a fantastic drill press. It has a very long quill travel of about five inches. It's very easy to use. So if you want to put the drill bit in, this one happens to have a keyless chuck. You just put the drill bit in, pin it down, and then you can drill your hole. It also has a digital readout. So this is a little box that measures how far up and down the drill bit goes. So if you want to drill a hole that's precisely one inch, you just move the handle down until you get to one inch, don't overshoot it, and then you get a nice precisely depth hole. So that can be super handy. What if happens if you want to drill a really long hole? So you've got a drill bit like this and you want to go down, say, 10 inches. Well, you can do that on this too because this table goes up and down. There's a crank just out of the frame here, and that will raise and lower this uh, table here, so you can put your workpiece on it, put this in, and then instead of using the quill, because this only goes about five or six inches, you can then crank up the table to drill your full depth hole. It'd be a bit of a pain, but you could do it. Now say you want to make a little slot in a piece of material. You may have been tempted to do that on a drill press before. You may drill straight down into it, and then try to move the materials left or right. And it doesn't work very well. Not only does it not work very well, but it's really bad for the bearings that are in the drill press because the drill press isn't designed to do that. And drill bits aren't sharp on the sides. These are not cutting edges, they're just flutes that move the material at the tip, which is the cutting edge, out of the way. On the other hand, this, which may look very similar to that, is an end mill, and this is designed to cut on the side. So these uh, are actually cutting edges, these are sharp, and as you move this left and right, it'll cut through the material. This also has bearings that are designed to allow you to move this left and right through the material. To help you with that, this table moves left and right and in and out. So you can cut slots or you know, diagonal lines or whatever you want just by moving this table around. So what else can you do with this? So you can also take this out, 
These chucks are also not designed to take load in that way. It's a three jaw chuck like this. So what you really want to do is take this out. And that comes out like that. And then you can put in what are called collets. And a collet is just similar to a chuck, except it only opens and closes about a sixteenth, maybe a thirty-second of an inch. You take this, put your end mill in here, and then this goes right back up in there. And then you can use that to cut your slots, and that works really well. And that's really what this is actually designed to do. You can also put other things in here though. So you can put this, which cuts gear teeth. So you can put that in there and then you have to get a special head to go over here to turn the gear, but you can use this to cut gears. You can put something like this, which is called a fly cutter in there. So this spins around and the cutting edge is down here. And as this moves across a piece of material, it'll flatten it out and make a really nice finish. So you can put, a, you know, like a six inch wide piece of material, run this across it, and it'll put a really nice finish on it. Let's say you want to drill some holes in this quarter inch steel plate here. Now you could use a hand drill. If you've ever tried that, you know it's a bit of a bear to do. You have to push real hard, takes a long time, a bit of a pain. Fine if you've only got to drill one or two holes, but if you've got to drill a whole bunch, it's going to be a real pain to do that with this. So instead, we're going to use the bridge port. Now if you had a drill press, you could do this. It would work just fine. It's going to work even better in this. For one, I've got a nice vise mounted here. This is a nice big hefty vise hold that piece perfectly still. I don't have to fight with it. There's lots of different ways you could hold this on this. You could put it in the vise, you could clamp it directly to the table. Either way, you don't have to try and hold it while you're doing it. And the table is designed to be clamped onto, unlike a lot of drill press tables where there's not really an easy way to do that. In addition, this has a power down feed function. So when I've got the drill in position, I just flick this lever over and it will automatically feed down at whatever rate I, I set it to and quickly drill that hole with basically no effort for me at all. So let me move you in here and we'll actually drill a hole here and you can see how easy this is. I've got the quarter inch steel plate set up in the vise here. I've got a 3 8 inch drill bit, something that would be pretty difficult to drill by hand. And I put a little dab of cutting fluid on there just to make things a little bit easier. So let me turn this on and we'll see how easy this is. That punched the hole through there with no problems whatsoever, super easy to do. Now say I wanted to actually tap this hole with some threads in it. I could very easily do that. You can adjust the speed of this down very slowly, and then you can put a tap in here, put the tap in the chuck, and feed it in, and it'll tap the hole just beautifully, and it'll also keep that perfectly in line with the hole so you have a nice perpendicular threads to your hole there. Super easy. Now I'm going to do something that is really more what this is designed to do. I'm going to take this hunk of aluminum here, Put another shoulder on it kind of like this here so i'm going to just run an end mill across the top i'm going to use a three foot carbide end mill just make a little shoulder there just so you can see kind of what this is more what this is designed to do so i'll put this in here and get started i've got that hunk of aluminum clamped in here i've got my end mill in here i've also turned up the speed bridgeport's super easy to adjust the speed on at least on this this model so i've got this uh, speed cranked up to be the appropriate speed for this end mill. So I'm just going to take a little pass on here. Nothing super crazy here, just to see so you can see how well this works and what this is really designed for. So I cut a nice little notch in here, no problems. That's really what this is designed for. However, let's say you're never gonna do that. You're never gonna you know, start machining big blocks of aluminum or anything like that. There's a lot of good reasons why you would still wanna get a bridge port instead of just a drill press. So let's say you've got a piece of wood here and you wanna cut a big mortise in it. You're gonna make some mortise and tenon joining. You wanna cut a nice big one though because it's gonna be under a lot of load. Your part's kind of small though, so you don't wanna use a handheld router. You won't be able to hold it over there. You could drop it on top of a router table but it's kind of sketchy with a small part like this on a router table, you're cutting a big deep slot. Not exactly the safest way to do it. Instead, you could do it on the bridge port. Now, some purists would say you should never cut wood on a bridge port. There's some reasons for that. There's a lot of uh, open ways in here. So the ways are kind of those sliding surface that are on there and they're all covered in oil. So the wood will get into that oil and kind of absorb the oil. And it's not the greatest thing, but it's not the end of the world. You can just clean that out. And this is not gonna be a production usage. so. It's not going to hurt it in the slightest. So let's put this big long router bit in here 
and see how we can cut a nice deep, deep mortise in this piece of wood. Now, one thing to note is this is really designed for metal, so it doesn't really spin fast enough for a bit like this. Typically, as you get into softer materials, you want to be spinning the bit faster. This bit should probably be spinning somewhere around five or 10,000 RPMs. The Bridgeport will only go up to about 3,500 RPMs. So we'll run it at that, and you can see, because this is such a rigid machine, it'll cut this without any problem at all. The one problem I will have milling a slot this deep, though, is these straight fluids here aren't going to clear the chips at all. So I'm going to be using the air compressor and blow out those chips as I'm cutting it. And we'll make multiple passes. I'm not going to run this all through in one pass. The bit would be up for that. Got a piece of wood in here. I'm going to turn on the mill. I'm also going to turn on the vacuum. Uh, I'll probably use a combination of air compressor and vacuum to get rid of the chips. And I apologize, my hand's going to go in front of the camera here when I'm adjusting the down feed on the quill here. So we'll make a couple passes here, make a nice deep mortise. So no problems there, cut about a, about a two and a half inch mortar, mortise into this piece of wood. I'm sure you could do that on a router table. Wouldn't be too big a deal if you're just making a small a pocket like that. But if you say you wanted to make a much bigger one, or you were coming much closer to the edges, or you're going through a knot or something, it could be kind of sketchy. On this, with the piece clamped into the vise, with the rigidity of this, it's never going to be an issue. It's a very safe operation. You don't have to worry about getting your hands near the bit or anything like that. Everything stays where it's supposed to be, and your hands are way far away from it. The other thing you can do with this is use other router bits, something some really large like profiling bits. This won't have any problems with. If you have a bit that has a bearing on it, but for whatever reason you can't have the bearing in your workpiece, say it's, it's too far down, you can clamp that down to the work table here and then just run it straight past the bit. There's no problems there. So it works like a much more useful router table. So what are the downsides to a bridge port like this? Well, the first one is cost. They cost anywhere now used, obviously. They cost anywhere from 1000 and on up. New one now costs, I think it's about 25000 for a new one now. So obviously the used ones will run in, in that range. But usually you can find a good one in reasonably decent condition for about $1,500 to $2,000, something like that. Now that's in the area I'm in, which is like the Northeast US. Um, areas where there weren't a lot of machine shops, you know, 15, 20 years ago, there's going to be a lot less of these available and they might be a little bit more expensive. So you may have to either wait a little bit longer to find one, pay a little bit more or drive somewhere where there are a lot more available. The other downside, um, and I think it's probably bigger downside than the cost because a, a good new drill press will cost about that same price. And even used, a used drill press that has a you know floor model with a six inch throw on the quill, it's going to be around a thousand dollars as well. So the bigger issue with this is the size and the weight of this. You can see this takes up kind of the whole corner of my shop here, and it weighs about 2,000, 2,500 pounds. So depending on where your shop is, getting it into the shop may be an issue. My shop's in my basement, and I had to take this all apart, and it was kind of an adventure to get it down the stairs. Or even just getting it home may be an adventure. If you don't have a truck or somebody who has a good trailer, it can be pretty tricky to get home. You can pay somebody to move it for you, but that's going to be extremely expensive. So that's really the only downside. So if you have some ingenuity, they're not a big deal to get home. And then it's a super useful tool, really handy. And I really love having it in my shop. So like I said, I'm gonna make another video next week on what all these different dials you uh, do. You may have seen me turn some of them. They do all sorts of different things. I'll go over that in the next video. And then the last video will be what to look for if you're actually gonna try and buy a, a bridge port. I'll go over kind of what where you're looking for and what things kind of don't matter and what things that really do matter for it. 
So until next time, thanks for watching. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it.